Hi everyone, welcome to Biological Theories Part 2 for your criminology. Uh, this topic, as we've already said, is a huge one, hence why there is Part 1 and Part 2. So Part 1, you are covering the physiological uh, aspects of the biological theory, so you have a look at Sheldon and Lombroso and their bizarre and unusual ideas. Today's video we're going to work through now for the next week, uh, I would say this is going to take us about a week, we're going to work through the genetic theory. So we're going to start a bit of science, there's a little bit of science in this, a little bit of psychology. We're going to start having a look at twin studies. So bear with me, we'll go over this nice and slowly and at least with these videos you can pause them, you can rewind them, you can go over them in your own time. Because for some of you you'll pick it up really quickly, for others of you, you might struggle a little bit with the ideas of twins. So let's get started anyway. I'll make myself smaller. Here we go. So let's... Mm -mm -mm. Fabulous. So theories of criminality, unit 2, 2.1. Biological theory, genetics. This is part two. Too. So in an exam, this is all together. So in an exam, this is all together. Uh, the only reason I split them up is just so that the work is not immense or the video is not immense for you to work through. So I've split it. This is not what an examiner will do. All right, so just to get your brains going, I'd like to have a go at this quick mix and match quiz. Which scholar came up with the idea that criminals were atavistic? Uh, I always want to say something like avatar or something with that, atavistic. Which of Sheldon's summer types are more prone to crime? Uh, what's the word for those big muscly ones? Which part of the brain, if damaged, could be linked to criminality? Name one scientist who has researched brain abnormality and crime and give one chemical in the body which can be related to crime. I will give you some answers here to help. So, oh, sorry, prefrontal cortex, testosterone, blood sugar, female hormone, serotonin, mesomorph, lambroso, rain and fallon. So can you mix your answers to the right ones? Mix and match. All right, so genetic theories. If criminals are born that way, as Lombros and Sheldon's theories might suggest, then their criminal tendencies must be inherited from their parents. If they're born that way, then they have to get it from their parents. Some people point to the fact that crime sometimes runs in families to support the idea that genes may play a role. Perhaps certain genes or combinations of genes lead to criminal tendencies. Hmm. Let's have a look. So, we need to first of all know about genes. I don't mean the genes you wear, I mean genes with a G. Um, our parents contribute 50% of our genes. So, each of your parents, you're made up of 50% from your mum, 50% from your dad, 50-50. The sperm and the egg, which you're all thinking, oh, year eight science all over again, oh yes, we're there. The sperm and the egg each contribute 23 chromosomes. So all these squiggles on this page, they're chromosomes. 23 chromosomes which are made up of genes which are made up of proteins. So basically you need to know that the sperm and the egg have 23 chromosomes. We know genes are associated with many of our features, so you get your height, your hair, your eye colour, your susceptibility to certain diseases from your parents. So certain diseases are genetic, for example. Um, you know, you and your family might, oh, you've got your great granny's knees there. I don't know. Um, but you, you will have features, so think, you know, are you more like your mum or are you more like your dad? Do you look like your mum? Do you have the height of your dad? Do you have characteristics of your parents? You know, how 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 similar are you to your parents? Um, because obviously you have inherited their genetics, you are inherited their genes. But it's under debate how much these genes actually affect how you behave, what you do, how you act. As non-biological features can play a role in this too, such as our upbringing and experiences. So upbringing, the way you are treated as a child and your experiences that you have often also affect the way that you then behave. So the question is, how much is genetics? How much is your environment? This is known as the nature-nurture debate. Now, some of you will have come across this before. Um, for those of you that haven't, it's very, very simple, so don't panic. Nature means the way you are born, naturally. Your genetics, nature, how much of it 
how much um by how you behave and what you do is based on nature your genetics um your makeup things that you can't control nurture is the way that you are nurtured your environment the way you are brought up the experiences that you have how much do they affect how you behave and what you do obviously all of this is asking the question of where does criminal behavior come from is it genetics or is it environment so in order to find out and answer that question is it genes or is it upbringing we've got to bring in twin studies I don't know if any of you are twins out there, if you are a twin or if you know twins, then chances are you will know these words already. But when it comes to twins, you get two types of twins. You can have same egg twins. What that means is, is when, the, when the sperm meets the egg, this is dreadful, the egg, it fertilises that egg, so that one egg is fertilised, that egg then splits and his twins but that they are from the same egg the same sperm so they're the same 50 50 genetic material they are completely identical the same sperm has fertilized their same egg and all that's happened is that egg has then split you then have monozygotic twins this is where two different eggs are fertilized so Different sperm, different eggs, still the same parents, still the same mum and still the same egg and still the same sperm, but they're different sperm strands and different genetic eggs. So even though they come from the same people, they're then, oh, they're not as much uh, genetically the same. So when we look at our words, you have MZ and DZ twins. MZ twins are monozygotic, mono, one, one egg 100% the same genes so 50 from the pair 50 from the mum 50 from the dad they are exactly the same 100% genetic material that make identical twins that's why they're identical whereas dizygotic are fraternal or non-identical twins that's as I said when two eggs get um, fertilized by two different sperms so they're still in the in the tummy at the same time they're still twins they're still born at the same time etc but they are genetically not identical they have 50 percent the same genes because obviously still the same egg and the mother still the same egg and the mother still the same sperm from the father but the actual eggs themselves are separate already and they've been fertilized by a separate bit of sperm you'll see why the separation of sperm is important in a second because the sperm actually does something very very important identical twins share a hundred percent of their genes so if crime is genetic if one twin is prone to criminality then the other is too this is the same for disease if one twin is uh, prone to a disease the other twin probably will as well things like um uh, breast cancers things like that obviously if they get a disease to do with the environment then obviously the other twin won't be affected but anything that is uh, that is genetically passed down if one twin has it the other twin is pretty much likely to get it as well if you are 100 percent shared shared genetic material but what other factors do identical twins share? So identical twins, monozygotic, same egg, same sperm, share 100% genetic material, but what else do they share? Could any of these factors also explain similar behaviour patterns? So, oh, so cute. Some evidence for genetics play a role. So we're going to look at the Christiansen study. This was a Danish study. Christiansen compared 3,596 pairs of monozygotic twins. Wow, that's a lot of twins. He found 52% concordance rate. Ooh, big word. Concordance rate means when one twin has it, the other twin has it. They are in concordance with each other. So it sounds a, a really big, fancy, complicated word. It isn't. It just means that 52% when one twin had it, 52% chance the other twin would have it as well. And so this means that in 52% of the twin cases, the twin pairings, the monozygotic pairings, where one twin had a conviction, the other one did too. What we need to do, though, is to see if this is, is the real effect of genes. Is this because of the genes, that because they say they share, they share the same genes that they have then, if one's a criminal, the other one is as well, or is there other things as well to play? 
Christensen then did the same for dizygotic twins, Di2. Dizygotic twins and found only 22% concordance rate. So only 22% where one twin was a criminal, the other one was as well. So that could imply that genetics do play a role when half of the sample of identical twins were criminals in pairs they were both criminals so 52 percent half of that study half of that 3596 half of them were a pairing of, of criminals when one was a criminal the other one was a criminal as well whereas only 22 percent was for the dizygotic so that does imply that potentially those that have same genetic material seem to do the same sorts of things so the conclusions from the Christiansen study, it appears that genes do play a part in the role of the tendency to criminality. Um, the more related you are to someone who has a criminal record, the greater the chance of you having one too. However, if it was totally based on genetics, you would expect that to be 100% concordance. It's only 50%. 2%. What about the other 48% where one was a criminal and one wasn't when they have identical genes? So it does imply that there are other factors at play than just your genetics. Because if it was just genetics, you're a criminal by genes, it would be 100% you're a criminal by genes as well. But it's not. It's only 52%. Now it's more than half, but there's still 48% that aren't. So there has to be other things that play a part as well. Another way to research genetics and crime is adoption studies. So in this method, adopted children are compared with biological parents and adoptive parents. Why do you think this is important? Why look at adoptions? Why look at adopted parents? Well, the reason is, is because you're then working out, again, the nature nurture. Is it genetics? Is it environment? Because obviously an adopted child will still have the genetics from their parents, but they'll be brought up in an environment with some other parents instead. So a child shares about 50% of their genes with their biological parent, but little of their environment. A child shares their environment with their adoptive parents, but none of their genes. This means we can separate out genes and environment to see which has the biggest influence. So if crime is genetic, who would the higher concordance be with? Hmm. Obviously, if you're saying non-adopted children, then that is obviously the conclusion that you could draw, that if crime is genetic then, um, oh sorry, not non-adopted, that if it is genetic, then even children that have adopted parents would still show criminal tendencies. So that's what the conclusion you could potentially draw from that, is that if it is to do with uh, your genes and not your environment, then children from, um, children with those genes would still bring that behaviour into an adoptive environment. So let's have a look. If crime is genetic, then the higher concordance should be with the biological parent. However, if it is more connected with upbringing experiences, then it'd be higher with the adoptive parents. But if it's with, obviously, if it's to do with genetics, they will still bring those genes with them, wouldn't they? So they would still behave in that way, whatever environment they're in. But if they do seem to show a lot of um, criminal tendencies, it might be to do with their upbringing if, if it's not to do with their genes. So it's having a look here to see about the adoptive and the genetic. This is potentially an issue, though, with these studies, because obviously if it is genetics and they're brought up in a criminal environment, how do you know if it's the environment in the adoptive environment or if it's because of their genes that they're doing it anyway? Um, but if it's but obviously if they remain with their biological parents and their criminals, then it would show as well. So there is a difficulty around using adoption studies to separate out environment from genetics because 
it still had to see that. Um, obviously, if we we're going to go into it in more detail, they have a look at adoptive families where they have their own biological children and then adopted children and then compare children that are from the same environment. And if one then becomes a uh, criminal, etc., it might be to more to do with the genetics. Or if all the children are criminal in that adoptive environment, it might be actually the environment. So it is still very, very complicated and it's very, very hard to see. Um, and this is where it is difficult as well to draw the those lines to say actually yes it is genetics or no it isn't it's environment that nature nurture debate so for you it's about looking at the different avenues and the different bits of research though um, rather than maybe drawing full conclusions you need to just discuss the difficulty there uh, why might it be important to know how soon after birth as well the adoption took place? Because again, if they've been in the environment of uh, biological parents for a long time, etc. So it's important to also know things like that. So it's very, very complicated. It's very complicated is this sort of uh, research. The evidence for genetics playing a role, we're going to look at Mednick's adoption study. Mednick compared 14,000 adopted sons in Denmark. God, that's a lot of adopted sons in Denmark. Using records, he found 20% concordance for criminal records with biological parents. So when parents were criminals, they were criminals. Compared with 14.7% concordance for criminal records with adopted parents. So again, what conclusions can you draw from this? A later study by Hutchings and Mednick also found the adoptees with a criminal record were more likely to have biological parents with criminal record than those adoptees who didn't have a criminal record. Again, the difficulty with this, as we will have a, evaluate it in a second, is 20% of criminals had criminal parents um, or were living with their biological parents. Again, it does not, that doesn't necessarily mean it's their genes, though it could also mean the environment they're being brought up in. Um, and again, 14.7 concordance with people criminal records that live with the adopted parents. Again, that could be environment, but it could be the genes that they've brought with them. So again, it's very, very hard to um, really kind of point the finger and say it's definitely genes or it's definitely the environment. Because you can never take the genes away from someone. So, over to you. What I would like to do, please, is to watch this clip and answer the questions. I'm going to email you some questions. I also would like you to complete the theories worksheet. So, again, I'm going to email that to you just up to question seven, though, please. So that is where you need to stop for today's lesson. We will take these ideas apart a little bit further next lesson. Um, and to kind of really delve into these adoptions and other and other genetic uh, examples and the genetic studies that we can look at. So for your first lesson, please stop here. But we're going to continue. So again, have a little go at this. Can you mix and match your answers to uh, the questions to the right answers? So what is the technical term for identical twins? Can you remember what that word was for one? What percentage of genes do non-identical twins share? What is concordance rate? Who is compared in an adoption study? Give one study that has shown a genetic component to criminality. And why can we say crime can't be totally genetic? Your answers to choose from are Christensen and Mednick. Where one person has a feature, the percent chance of the other person having it. Monozygotic. Because MZ twin concordance isn't 100%. The adopted person with their biological and adopted parents, adoptive parents, about 50%. So can you link the right, the question to the right answer, please? Get those brains going. All right. So, Jacob's syndrome. Now, this is quite interesting. There's another possible genetic cause of criminality. It relates to an abnormality of sex hormones, back to those year eight science lessons. Humans normally have 46 chromosomes. We said last time, didn't we? 23 and 23, 23 mum, 23 dad, 23 egg, 23 sperm, 46 in total, arranged 23, in, 23 pairs. Each pair made up of one chromosome from each parent. So every grouping, one from each. 
the 23rd pair decides whether you are going to be biologically male or female. One of the chromosomes is always an X from the mum. So you are always, every single human being has one X chromosome. But it's the sperm from the father that decides whether it's X or Y. Two X's are female, XY is male. However, in Jacob's syndrome, an extra Y chromosome is inherited, leading to XYY. And so people, males with XYY, because obviously it has to be a male, because obviously females are XX, so it has to be only male, so XYY. Males are born with this chromosomal condition are typically very tall, well built, of low intelligence. And Jacob researched the possibility that this abnormality might lead higher levels of criminality. Let's see how accurate he is. So, he uses this case study to back up his theory. Price and Whitmore found XYY males were generally less mature and more unstable than XY males and had a tendency to commit property crime without a purpose, such as pointless crime. There is also a higher than average proportion of XYY males among prisoners and inmates of secure psychiatric hospitals. So we're not just talking about um, hospitals or institutions where people need to go for their mental health uh, and for support. We're talking about um, people that are clinically um, put into a psychiatric unit rather than prison. So we're talking about criminals here that are in a secure lockdown facility. Uh, then in the general population, there are 15 per thousand men in prison that have Jacob syndrome compared to just one per thousand in the general normal population. And the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, who tortured and murdered 33 men, also was believed to have had XYY chromosomes, is said to have had, we don't know fully though, so just be careful how we use that example because it's, it's believed but it's not known. Alright, so strengths and weaknesses of all of this. The strengths, comparing monozygotic twins because they are genetically identical is very useful and logical way because if one twin has it, if the other twins got it, it could show genetics because obviously they have the same genetic material. So it's a very useful and logical way it can be tested scientifically. These studies are very useful to separate genetic and environmental causes of crime, the heart of the nature-nurture debate. Some studies support, such as Alder in 2007, found, the, uh, sorry, found that aggression, aggressive and violent behaviour are at least partly caused by genetics. Um, Ishikawa, 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 there we go, and Rain found a higher concordance rate for monozygotic 44% than diazygotic 21.6%. So they again tested that. And when we're looking at these cohorts of twins, they're big sample size as well. Think of that one that was over 3,000. They're big sample sizes, so we're not just talking about one or two. However, parents treat monozygotic twins more alike than dizygotic, so monozygotic twins also might feel closer to each other than, than, than dizygotic, so maybe they have more of an influence over each other. Adopted children are often placed in environments similar to their birth parents, class, ethnicity, locality. So that might explain the similarity rather than genetic factors. Um, Gottfriedson and uh, Hershey argue the evidence for a genetic component to criminality from adoption studies is small, that it's very, very hard to see in these adoption studies um, you know, the, the genetic likelihood that it's from that, uh, from the biological parents rather than the environment. Again, it's very, very hard to see that. And Jacob's theory, syndrome, sorry, is relatively rare. One in a thousand. That's, you know, to then draw conclusions from that is kind of stretching a little bit. All right, exam style question time. So I'd like you to have a go, please, at describing how genetics might be related to criminality. Uh, six marks for this, so at least six points, examples, case studies, etc. Um, you don't need to evaluate, it's just a describe question. So you might want to use some of these things to help you. Um, so explain that our genes are inherited from our parents. Um, explain again how, you know, 50-50 with your 23 chromosomes from each. There is a debate about whether they influence our behaviour 
as well as physicality. Crime sometimes runs in families, so shared genes, explain monozygotic and dizygotic uh, because 100% versus 50%. Maybe give a study, maybe the Christiansen uh, with the concordances, but again, use details, give specifics of what they found and what it could imply. Uh, explain how adoption studies work, so they separate genes and environment, so you could give Mednick. Um, and also explain Jacob's XYY um, syndrome and a piece of evidence. And obviously when it comes to the adoption studies as well, if, if the person that's come with those genetics then isn't a criminal, it, it could imply that actually it is the environment that they've grown up in, um, that even, you know if they'd have stayed with their biological parents then it might have been the environment, etc. So it's all to do with environments that you're being brought up into um, and, and how separating that you know the environments from the genes whereas if you continue to be a criminal even in a different environment you know it might still be the genetic your genetics are playing a part etc so it's just exploring it but always keeping it an open mind that it is very hard to separate because obviously even with someone living in a different environment you can't take away the genes and the genetics that they have All right, second activity that I would like you to have a go at, please. This is the case, this is a case study of Donna, uh, and I would like you to now, from this whole theory, whole topic, uh, part one and part two, I want you to give, um, do as many links as you can with this story. So, Donna was only a toddler when she was taken into care. Social workers had become concerned because her home life was chaotic and her parents were, were petty thieves and drug users. She was deemed to be neglected both physically and emotionally. Her dad was prone to violent, angry outbursts and had spent a period of time in prison whilst Donna was two. Her mother had also spent in time in a drug rehabilitation centre when Donna was a baby. Social workers' reports say that when taken into care, she was distant and emotional emotionally withdrawn. Donna was placed with a series of foster parents but she shrilled to bond with them and relationships tended to break down. This pattern persisted for a number of years. Eventually she moved into her friend's family's house uh, home as she had formed some sort of relationship with them. The family were known locally as carer criminals. At the age of 11 Donna began substance abuse including alcohol. She is now 15 years old and rarely in school and has often been in contact with youth justice system for offences such as shoplifting and assault. The police and social services are concerned that she is learning criminal techniques from the family she is living with so i would to link as many of the different things that we've done so far to this star in as many different ways as you can so maybe brain abnormality damage biochemicals genetics etc finally last little bit uh, I would like to complete the rest of your biological theories worksheet, so just question eight onwards and then as i mentioned in our chat that we had you need to start so, excuse me, you need to start your revision post or our flashcards. I'm going to set up a Padlet for you to share the revision posters that you are doing. But obviously, I'll do that in, in, a, in a little while's time. You don't have to feel the pressure because obviously there's a lot of work to write there. There's a lot of notes to make. There's a lot of activities to do. So, again, we'll give you plenty of time to work through all of this. But I do need to see that these revision posters have been starting to put together, even if I have to give you another lesson to do that. Okay, so that's unit two, 2.1, biological theories done. You need to make sure you have notes on all of these sections. Make sure you've got notes on all the different parts. Make sure that you've got an understanding of the different studies and how they link, etc. Um, and obviously any questions or problems, just send me an email. Otherwise, uh, bye for now, everyone. I'm just going to sh shut you down. Fabulous. See you later, everyone. Bye.